On this program, we're going to be studying one verse in John's Gospel. We've been going through the Gospel of John on this series, but today, on this program, we're going to focus in on one verse of John's Gospel, and that verse is found in chapter 3 and verse 16. Now, you may already be familiar with this verse, but let me go ahead and read the verse to you out of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This verse is at once both simple and yet profound. The wording is very simple. Any child could understand it. And many children learn this verse at an early age, perhaps in a Sunday school class or in a Bible club. And yet, the greatest minds the world has ever known have not been able to plumb the depths of the meaning of this verse that tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We want to focus our attention on this verse in this program and see if we can come to understand something of the meaning of what is behind these simple words. I want you to notice the first phrase, for God so loved the world. For God so loved, there the emphasis is on the heart of God. And here we're brought face to face with the fact that God has a heart of love. You notice that it says the first two words, for God. God is the originator of the plan of salvation as recorded in the Word of God, the Bible. And these words, for God, point us to the fact that salvation is not something that has been humanly devised. It is not a plan that man has schemed up himself. It is not some sort of scheme that some man has thought up. For God tells us that he is the originator of this plan of salvation that we find in his word. You notice the next phrase, so loved. And who can plumb the depths of that little word, so? The words so loved point to the fact of the infinite love of God. Who can measure the heart of the love of God? Who can measure the depth of the love of God? A God that is not just out in the universe somewhere, far removed from our circumstances and our situations of life, but a God who reveals to us the fact that His is a heart of love for his creation, that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You'll notice that the word loved is in the past tense, and that shows us something very important. For the Bible tells us that God did not just express his love when we were uh, something wonderful, when we were something good, or when we were someone or something that was lovable. God showed his love to us, as the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet dead in our sins, while we were yet ungodly and unlike God and unlovable, God loved us. And he showed us that love. He displayed that love to us by sending his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, as the scripture so clearly declares. You know, a question that might come to our mind is why? Why would God send his son into the world? Why would God come up with a plan of salvation in the fashion that he has? What would motivate God to do such a thing? On a human plane, if someone does us wrong or someone does us a grave injustice, Love is usually the farthest thing from our mind. And yet God would display his love in such a fashion to fallen creatures, to fallen men and women who are steeped in sin, whose hearts are far from God. Why? Because God loved us. 
That's why it's the love of God that motivated him to provide a means of salvation to a fallen world. You notice the next phrase, for God so loved the world. The world is the object of God's love. When we say the world, we're not talking about just the, the trees and the flowers and the plants and the animals. We're talking about people. People just like you. People just like me. This is the world that God loved. It's a world of humanity. And we are reminded a number of times that when the Lord Jesus was here on earth, he looked out on the crowds and he had compassion on them. He showed and displayed His love toward them. God's love is toward people just like you and just like me. It's people that God loves. The world. The expression the world tells us that none are excluded from this great plan of God. None are excluded from the heart of God. For the world means all of the world, all of the people that are in the world that have ever lived and that ever will live, God's love is displayed toward them. The world also emphasizes the fact when we hear that expression, the world, the state of the world. Oh, we look around the world today and we wonder how could God love a world of humanity that is living in the fashion that, that men and women live in today, that people live in, the fallen world, a rebellious world, a world that is lost and steeped in sin, a world whose hearts are far from God and their thoughts are not of God. And yet, this is the love of God, that God loved the world, knowing full well the depths of the depravity of man, God still displayed His love in such a way. The things that we've just mentioned, for God so loved the world, emphasize to us the love of God. But there's something else as well. The next phrase tells us that God so loved that He gave His only begotten Son. The emphasis here is on the grace of God. You notice it says, God so loved that He gave. Here we see the grace of God extended toward man. The great heart of God going out to man in a supreme act of grace, unequaled in all of the history of the universe. God's heart reaching out to man in an act of grace, an act of undeserving grace, of unmerited grace, of God bestowing favor in such a way. And then it says that God so loved that He gave His only begotten Son. There again is the emphasis on the gift of God, the immeasurable gift of God. Who can measure what God gave to secure this plan of salvation? Salvation that is free to you and I, to you and me, but salvation that cost God. Someone has defined the word grace as an acrostic, that is, taking the first letters of the word grace and giving a word for each of those letters. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a pretty fair definition of what it cost God to supply the salvation that He has given. And then when we read that He gave His Son, His only begotten Son, the emphasis there is on the love of God in action. God's love was not some sort of passive thing. God's love was displayed by the action He took. How do we know that God loved in such a way? Because God gave His only begotten Son. Pause it. Yes, we see the love of God in action. The grace of God that has been displayed toward the world of fallen men. But the love of God alone cannot save. Did you realize what I just said? That the love of God alone is not enough to save? God's justice must be satisfied. 
And that's what we find as we look in this next part of this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The love of God motivated God to send His Son. But it is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that satisfies the just demands of God and allows God to extend His grace toward man. The love of God alone is not enough. The justice of God had to be satisfied. God gave His Son in the ultimate supreme act of sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And when the Son of God died there on the cross as a substitute for sinners, when He bore the penalty of the wrath of God there on the cross, He satisfied the just demands of God so that God could now be declared to be just and the justifier of them which believe in Jesus. The next part of our verse says that whosoever believeth in him, the emphasis here is on the condition of salvation. That whosoever, that tells us of the scope and the extent of the salvation that God has provided. That whosoever, who does that mean? Why, it means anyone. It means me, and it means you. You're one of those whosoevers that if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice the sole condition that whosoever believeth on him, should in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The sole condition of salvation. Over a hundred times we find in John's Gospel alone the word believe. And we find that this is the sole condition that John lays down in a book that is specifically written to tell us how we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life in His name. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's not according to works, but it's by His grace. By grace through faith we're saved, that all of the glory might go to God and none to us. You notice the object of salvation in Him. It's not just a general belief. Believe in Him. That means that we trust in Him. That we are relying upon Him. That we are resting in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation. This is the condition. You notice next that it says, should not perish but have everlasting life. And here the emphasis is on the results of salvation. Should not perish. Deliverance has been provided. There's no need to go out into eternity lost forever. God has provided salvation in His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you will believe in Him, you will not perish. You notice next it says, but have everlasting life. There we see the emphasis is that salvation is a present possession, something God wants to give you. And there's the assurance of heaven and the assurance of salvation. He that believes in Him should not perish, but have as a present possession the salvation that God provides, the right relationship with Jesus Christ that comes through belief in Him. Everlasting life. What is it? Well, that has to do with both the quantity, endless life, but also the quality, the very life of God Himself that is given to us upon belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we end our program today, in this portion of our program, I ask you the question, have you ever believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? and that should you die today, you'd go to be with Him? Or are you lost and still in your sin, and you know that if you die tonight, die today, that you're not right with God? 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and according to God's Word, He backs it with His very Word, you will have everlasting life, and you will never perish. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, even this very moment. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What wonderful words this verse contains. We've seen as we've looked through this verse on this program, as our approach has been to take it apart, sort of verse by verse, or rather phrase by phrase, and examine the different phrases. For God so loved. The emphasis there upon the heart of God, the love of God. When we think of Jesus Christ and His work upon the cross, one of the things that comes to our mind immediately is the love of God. The fact that God loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die the death on the cross that He died, to bear my sin and to become a substitute for sin there on the cross. We see here the heart of God. If you get nothing else out of this program, remember that God is not a God who is somewhere far off in the universes, some sort of being floating through space, unconcerned, or unaware of you or me. God is vitally concerned. God has a heart of love. Throughout the scripture we see it displayed. And ultimately in that final act upon the cross of Calvary, we see the love of God and the heart of God there displayed. If you want to know what God is like, look to the cross and see that he has a heart of love. We notice also that the next phrase, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. The gift of God is salvation. The gift of God is his son, Jesus Christ. Here the emphasis is on the grace of God, what he gave. God's love seen in action, in giving to us, in giving to the world, his son, Jesus Christ. And remember, that we pointed out that the grace of God tells us also that the justice of God had to be satisfied, that the love of God alone was not enough to save us. God's justice had to be satisfied. And when Jesus Christ said upon that cross, it is finished, it was enough. The work of salvation was done. God could freely extend his grace to all that believe. That's the next phrase we saw, that whosoever believeth in him, and that is the condition of salvation. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you presently believing on him and resting in his finished work upon the cr a cross and nothing else? This is the condition of salvation, to turn in repentance to him, to own the fact that you are a sinner and come to God believing on his son and the sufficiency of his work alone for salvation. The results, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you want to have life everlasting, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to do so.